he will stand upon the earth. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. Do not bring your servants into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Paul reminds us, I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Remember not the sins of you, nor the transgressions, but according to your mercy, they come. Paul again, none of us lives for himself, and none of us dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it, not were, if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so it will be for those who died as Christians. God will bring them to life with Jesus. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us a true faith and a sure hope. Help us to live as those who believe in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to eternal life, and strengthen this faith and hope in us all the days of our life, through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we sing together, Abide With Me.
The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I can lack nothing. He will make me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside still waters. He will refresh my soul and guide me in the right pathway for his namesake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. You spread a table before me in the face of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup will be full. Surely your goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, reading from verse 20 to 28 and 50 to 58. But in fact, Christ has raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father after all he has destroyed, every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when, it's, when it says, all things are subjected in, all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who puts all things in subjection under him so that God may be all in all. What I am saying, sisters and brothers, in this flesh and blood, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you, a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will, ri will be raised imperishable and will be changed. For this perishable body, perishable body must be put into imperishability, and this mortal body must be put on immortality. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, all excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you all so very much for coming today. It's lovely to see so many people here um, to celebrate Shirley's life. It was a very long and a very full life. Um, and so it's lovely that so many of you can come along and be here today. Um, home and family are important to most people. And I think they were particularly important to Shirley. And I think the reason for that 
is that she never had a home of her own until she was actually 13. Um, her mother died when, uh, sorry, her father died, I should say, when mum was only three and her sister Jilly was even younger. Um, and so uh, her mother was left without any assets and needed to find a job. And mum uh, spent the, her early years in the St. Mary's Children's Home here in Maritzburg. Um, and then when she was five, she went to school, boarding school at Collegiate, and her holidays were spent at various relatives' homes. She absolutely loved Collegiate, and she loved all those holidays with her, her um, various relatives, but she didn't actually have a home until Florence remarried when mum was 13, and um, he uh, her, new, her new father provided, well, he was a father, he provided a very loving home, and he provided, which came complete with four new sisters who became much loved. And, and then along came Evelyn, and suddenly there was a family of seven girls, and it was quite, quite a handful, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, so that was mum's start in life, not, not the easiest, um, but that was it. Um, so um, those early years gave her a very strong belief in the value of um, education, particularly for girls, and that it was very important that women should be able to uh, have careers and support, um, support themselves and their families if that became a, an issue. And so I was very grateful, and I think those values have been passed on to her, all of her children. Um, having said that, that you know, she was very focused on careers and things, I have to say that mum was fired from her first job on the very first day. <laughs> Um, and the reason she was fired was because she was wearing bright red lipstick <laughs> and a very tight-waisted skirt. It was all the rage in 1949 when she got her first job at Glencoe High School. I don't know, is there anyone here from Glencoe? <laughs> I hope not, because <laughs> she, she, the, um, the headmaster met her at the gate, saw her, and immediately phoned the Department of Education and said, she cannot possibly work here. She was far too distracting. <laughs> um, so um, he, he phoned the Department of Education and they said, no, you've got to keep her, she's got to stay. And she did stay there for two years. Um, Glencoe was one of those postings in, that was absolutely considered the absolute pits for any young person. They did not want to be posted to Glencoe. But she actually quite enjoyed it and she clearly did quite well because um, one of the inspectors said um, in a report, <laughs> that she was casting pearls before swine. So, so sorry anyone from the people from Glencoe, I'm sure she didn't see you like that at all. Um, uh, she, she, she taught uh, English literature and she was also qualified to teach woodwork. Teaching singing or sport were not really her thing. Uh, she didn't think, that, which most other teachers did as their, their other sort of option, but woodwork was her other option, which proved very valuable. Um, so she, um, she qualified, uh, so after uh, Glencoe, uh, her two years there, she moved to the Indian Girls' School in Maritzburg, and she absolutely loved teaching there. Um, most of the girls who were at the school, and um, this would have been, a, 1949 was Glencoe, so just uh, 1951, most of the girls were the first generation in their family to go to school, um, and they were very keen and eager for education. And um, mum really valued for many years some gifts that they had made out of the silk from silkworms from the classroom that they gave to her. And she kept those for many years. Um, she did her teacher training in Maritzburg, but she had previously been um, at um, Rhodes University. I think she partied a bit too much and her father ordered her back to Natal where she could be uh, under, on a closer leash. Um, <laughs> There certainly seems to be a lot, a, a lot of sort of interesting people in her life, including not one, but two boyfriends who claimed that their grandfathers had been eaten by cannibals. <laughs> I thought it was just a tall story to impress the girls, but she assures me that it was true, and they were missionaries, and they had been eaten by cannibals. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> Anyhow, she met Dad at a party in Maritzburg, and she, she remembered up until her dying day, in fact, she was telling Diane Paul about it only about three weeks ago, the day that she first set eyes on Dad. She was sitting um, in, on the floor at a party organised by Dawn Began, um, a 
great friend of hers. Um, and she was sitting by the fireplace with her back to the fire, and in walked this man, and she saw, set her eyes on him and thought, wow. Um, anyhow, he came over and sat on the floor next to her, and they got chatting. And a few, uh, about a week or so later, she got a phone call from him, and he said, would you like to come and deliver newspapers with me? She thought, oh, wow, this is odd, but okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'm up for that. And so off they, she came and picked her up, and off they went. And it was only when they got to Oraby, the airstrip at Oraby, it wasn't an airport then, that she realized they were going up in a plane. Dad had qualified as a pilot during the war, and to keep up his flying hours, he had a Sunday job, which involved delivering newspapers to farms. They flew over the farms, circled the, the house, and leaned out and dropped the newspaper onto the lawn. Hoped it wouldn't land in the fish pond or whatever, but that's, that's what they did. So it was quite a thrilling first date. Um, but it was made even more memorable by when they um, were on their way home, they got as far as Otto's Bluff, flying over Otto's Bluff, and I suppose it's a bit turbulent there. She didn't feel too good. Dad quickly turned one of the newspapers into a bit of a cone shape. She was quite sick, um, and by the time they landed at Oraby, the cone had disintegrated under the volume. <laughs> she was covered in sick and that was vomit, and that was her first date. But clearly he wasn't put off because they were married in 1953. They then moved to um, Amzumkulu, where Dad um, carried on his, uh, had a very successful surveying practice and, this, uh, and the farm. And uh, mum was very involved in the man running of the farm. Um, she ran the orange pack house. Um, it was the first uh, citrus pack house in southern Natal. Um, and you know, it's a, a very big enterprise exporting uh, to Europe and uh, selling to local traders who came from the Transkai and southern Natal to buy in bulk from her. Um, so that was a very big part of her, of her work. Um, she also um, did a lot of other things on the farm. Um, it, the dairy was one of her areas. Um, she kept the books for the surveying practice, and I can remember colouring in maps for her and with her for, for various clients, etc. She was always busy. She was the local correspondent for the Coxdad Advertiser. She campaigned for the Progressive Party. Um, she alienated, I must say, many local people when she, with her political views and had the door shut in her face, which is a difficult thing in a very small community, but you know, she persisted. Uh, she got involved with flood relief on not just one occasion, twice, I think, when the river flooded. Um, she set up a Sunday school in Numbers and Kulu, and she played tennis and bridge and golf and all of those things, where W, not golf, WI and, and all sorts of things. And she entertained a huge variety of people. Um, as the last landowners in the Transkai, white landowners in the Transkai, they were expected to entertain all sorts of dignitaries, and sometimes at the drop of a hat. Um, these included bishops, the primate of all Scotland, I'm not sure what a primate is or does, but that was what he was. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, the uh, Kaiser Matanzima, who became the, the Prime Minister of Transkai, and all sorts of waifs and strays. There were two round-the-world cyclists who came at different times, all sorts of hitchhikers, um, people whose cars had broken down, including two nuns with a load of pigs, <laughs> and spent the night, including the pigs. <laughs> and um, she even got to serve tea to Nelson Mandela when he came to Amzumkulu. The local ANC approached her and said, could she help organize um, Ma Mandela's visit? Um, so she, she got involved. And so when he arrived, he was greeted to Amzumkulu with the fla um, palm waving of palm tree, palm leaves, and ANC banners and things. The palm leaves had come from Ibuta. And um, afterwards, they had a reception where tea was served but it was only open to members of the ANC, so she was made an honorary member of the ANC for a day, so she could serve him tea. <laughs> um, and despite all that activity, um, she managed to produce five absolutely gorgeous children. 
Um, but, but life wasn't all that easy. Um, you, about 15 years into marriage, um, the beautiful house that they'd built, which was uh, had a pink painted uh, octagonal house with a high pitched thatched roof, uh, it burned to the ground in, in less than in about 10 minutes. Um, and the heat was so hot that the glass was left pooled in little pools of liquid at the, on the floor. Um, so that was, you know, but ne friends and neighbors really came to the fore, providing us with clothing, with everything we needed, with accommodation, and it was brilliant. And then we, the, the, the mum and dad subsequently moved into the main farmhouse where my grandparents were, um, and that's where we carried on living uh, for many years. Um, in 1994, Mum and Dad moved to Hilton, to Connor Road. They sold the farm and moved up here. Um, and Mum became very involved with this church. Um, I often remember coming here with her. She would sit on these pews with her legs stretched out, slide up and down, tidying up all the hymn books. I see we now have the hymns up there, so there's probably not hymn books to tidy up, but I have many memories of doing that. And she was very involved with the church flowers. Um, and used to do the rotors for the church flowers even when she was no longer fit to do flowers herself. And sorry, Angie, I don't know where you are, but can I say the flowers here look absolutely gorgeous today. Thank you. Um, and then uh, she was one of the first peaceful residents to move into Garlington. Um, I think that was probably about 15 years ago now. And she certainly used to, got very involved with everyone in Garlington. She would welcome people when they arrived um, very often with a jar of homemade marmalade. Um, Mum never uh, let anything put her back. She had a very much a positive can-do attitude. And um, certainly her ne leg never held her back from you know, doing, playing tennis. Uh, when she was, for her 80th birthday, we made her walk the um, Wild Coast Meander from, was it Trenaries where we started? Trenaries to Cobb Inn for her 80th birthday. She complained that other people go on cruises and things, and she had to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so she, she, she was intrepid and uh, this very strong can do attitude. And when, when she was well into her 80s, she drove to Cape Town all on her own, and many people were horrified. <laughs> and I had phone calls overseas saying, don't let her do this, and I think brothers and sisters had the same, but it was the sort of thing she liked to do. Um, she hated being told, you can't do something. Bongi and Cindy will know that. She hated to be told, you can't do anything. Um, and, you know, when someone said, you can't walk, she would get up and try and walk. And she told me, asked me to time her one day, um, her lap of the veranda. It took her 10 minutes to walk <laughs> one little length of the veranda, but she did it. Um, so, you know, she was, she was intrepid. Um, and, and strong, yes. Surely, and um, we talk about people, you know, meeting St. Peter at the pearly gates, but Shirley didn't have to wait till then to meet angels. She was surrounded by angels right here. And our, there's so many people here who are just wonderful to her. And I'd like to thank you all. Whether you just popped by and waved at her, at her as you walked through at Darlington, and all those people who popped in or phoned or visited or read to her. Um, I'd really love to thank you all so much. There are far too many angels here for me to thank all, but I would particularly like to thank uh, George, um, who read to her every Friday, Penny, who came and read to her on Mondays, Bongi, who was with her for so many years and looked after her for so long, and Cindy, who was only with her for nine months, but was just such a breath of fresh air and always made her smile when she came in uh, on the Friday evening, Friday afternoon, Friday, Friday morning rather, onto duty. Thank you so much for all your loving care um, and for all you did for Mum. Um, Mum had a great talent for bringing people together. Um, she was never the greatest cook, but she did have a talent for bringing people together. She was a great hostess. And she's brought us all together today, even though she's no longer with us, no longer alive. Um, we do hope you'll be able to join us all after this service for tea here in the hall, uh, and then on at Garlington at Mum's house uh, for drinks. She always much preferred drinks to tea, so I do hope you can, <laughs> hope you can come along and join us there. 
Um, just a little bit of admin. When you get there, uh, when you get to the gates, if you just tell them you're going to Shirley Buttons, they'll let you straight through without asking you to sign in and all that sort of thing. Um, so that's mum, uh, life history in a nutshell. Um, for, for us kids, I think, if mum never wanted a eulogy because she said no one's perfect. And um, I think the big, biggest burden she ever gave us is that we keep getting told how wonderful and amazing our mother is. And it's quite hard to live up to. But uh, she wasn't perfect, but she was amazing. So thank you. Um, and now um, mum's grandchildren are going to have a little word as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, I'm Sally. Um, one of, I'm Shirley's second oldest grandchild and up till earlier I thought I was possibly the favourite but then I saw the photos on her wall and I think there's one of me so maybe fourth or fifth. <laughs> um, Granny was a remarkable person who made an indelible mark on everyone that she met, especially on us her grandchildren. Uh, she's written some infamous letters of advice to us over the years. When I was moving to Johannesburg, uh, she scandalously warned me to be wary of married men. Apparently they tell you they'll leave their wives, but they never do. So, <laughs> I met a nice single man. <laughs> Her um, unusual choice of birthday presents also had the cousins and giggles, but we never doubted that she loved us. Photos of her family and some questionable art hung proudly on her walls, and it always made us feel very spe special to feature there. Granny was and always will be a massive inspiration to all of us. Um, her daily swims, no matter the weather, her complete lack of self-pity about her leg, and her fierce independence that saw her going on a girl's trip to Turkey at 85 and driving solo across the country to Cape Town in her late 80s. She really is a fine example of how to live life to the fullest. So thanks, Granny. We love you and we miss you. Growing up in Amzamkulu, Paul, myself, and later Janie were very fortunate to have Gandhi and Grandpa on our doorstep. For the first few years of our lives, we lived a mere 100 meters up the drive from Gandhi. My mum would often find Paul's bed empty in the morning as he had run down the hill to jump into their bed, where I'm sure he was told stories and treated with sweet tea. This may possibly be where he acquired a sweet tooth, as Gandhi always had sugar cubes available for us to pop into our tea or take a few to feed the horses that had come in from herding the cattle. I don't ever remember having breakfast at home, although I'm sure I did, but it was always porridge with granola sprinkled on down at Grandpa and Gandhi's house. The Buta was a fun place for us kids. Gandhi had a beautiful big garden that we would explore for hours. Often she would take us for picnics to the clay stream where we would sit and make clay animals and eat the biscuits we had made with her. To this day, Gandhi always had a tin of biscuits in her house and they've been enjoyed around numerous cups of tea. As we grew up, we would often go and spend part of the school holidays with Gandhi and Grandpa in Hilton. This was most fun for us farm kids. Our visit nearly always included a picnic at the Queen Elizabeth Park, a trip to the Rotunda to stock up on some few fresh items, it's hard to believe, and of course a couple of chocolates, and a walk to the playground to ride on the roundabout, and the visit to the Hilton Station and the odd Hilton tennis tournament that she enrolled us into. We loved spending time with Gandhi and Hilton, swimming in a rock pool, having breakfast on the veranda, and playing dress up in her clothes and jewelry. Gandhi definitely ignited our love for card games, and every evening we would play Chase the Ace around the table. I hope our kids will enjoy playing cards as much as Paul, Janie, and I do. When we started at boarding school, Gandhi was there for us when we needed her. She managed to watch as many sporting fixtures as she could fit in between all her social commitments, as well as all our school plays that we had on. She always visited us, and she would arrive with a bag of biscuits and a few chocolates. Gandhi's home was always welcoming and inviting to all, and she would often have a house full of our friends. All the great grandchildren are very fortunate to have met Gandhi and spent their time with her, whom they adored, even though they usually turned her house upside down and increased the noise level somewhat. It was always a highlight for Daniel, Nick, Ruby, and Jesse to visit Gandhi. They knew exactly where her sweet drawer was, they entertained themselves riding on her wheelchair and stroller and decorated her wall with pictures. Gandhi never wanted to miss out on anything. 
Just a few months back, Dan and Nick were at the Garlington playground and Gandhi took it upon herself to walk all the way there despite her unsteady legs. She loved immersing herself in their lives, reading stories to all the kids and engaging in genuine conversations with them. Gandhi lived for family visits. She told me it's what brings her the most joy and she even said she loves the noise they bring with them. Gandhi showed an interest in everyone, young and old. She was admired by many and lived a life full of fun and adventure. I'm sure Gandhi has the record for the fastest trip to Mboiki, the car with the most dings, and the ability to always burn a roast. <laughs> I always had a huge amount of respect for Gandhi. She was loyal, kind, loving, and respected by all. Gandhi, we love you so much, and we are so grateful we got to spend so much time with you. You will always be in our hearts, and we will cherish you and all that you taught us. We are proud to be your grandchildren. We love you. What to say about someone who lived such a full, long life when you're given just a couple of minutes? Gandhi was my favorite person. I was lucky enough to see her nearly every day for two years while we were living in Garlington, where she would famously arrive for drinks on her scooter, Jensen, with a bottle of brandy safely stored in the front basket and a tupperware of her soup. She always thought we weren't eating enough and said quite a few times, it must be a welcome break from Woolies. <laughs> if you've ever sampled Gandhi's famous leftover soup, you'll know it wasn't quite. <laughs> Ironically, Gandhi herself was the exact opposite to her soup, only the finest ingredients and top quality. David and I lived with Gandhi for a couple of weeks before moving down to the Cape. We were shocked to find that she had more visitors than anyone else in the estate, and we were exhausted from socializing just a week into our stay with her. Refusing an evening drink was just not an option in Gandhi's house. She loved her family deeply, and I remember many a walk and picnic when we were young and visiting her in Hilton. She believed there wasn't much a brisk walk couldn't fix. She also loved a long drive, and um, Sal and Ro also commented on this, but she did drive down to the Cape well into her 80s, but would visit us often throughout our childhood. She hated flying, so this is the reason for all the driving. She said it was too much of a hassle. All that waiting around, she said. It just didn't suit her. Gandhi always had something on. Someone coming for tea, a bridge game to get to, a book club lunch to host, or a friend to visit. On behalf of Megs, Emmy, and I, we will miss our Gandhi, and we loved our time we had with her. But we know that she's smiling down on us, probably finishing a cryptic crossword and ready for a walk. Um, so I think Rory explained quite well, or spoke quite well, about how uh, good a host Gandhi was and how well she entertained. So I think it wouldn't surprise anyone to know that she did Christmases in particular 100% with uh, full meals, often <laughs> assisted in the kitchen, uh, desserts. I think what made her quite unique, though, was her fondness for Christmas pudding. <laughs> um, uh, I remember, so she used to have uh, an assortment of Monopoly pieces she put into her Christmas pudding, and depending on what she got, that kind of predicted how your year would pan out. Um, <laughs> uh, the one in particular, the, uh, uh, I think it was a 50 cent coin that <laughs> indicated you were coming into riches the following year. Uh, and there was the famous um, button, button, button bachelor, which was the button that indicated you were going to remain single, so <laughs> you got another chance. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, well, I think the favorite Christmas pudding story is uh, she used to, I think as you do, put brandy on. Um, and the one year, maybe to help fix the taste, she put a bit too much uh, and ended up, upon lighting it, um, losing her eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> and I think some of her hair caught on fire. So um, yeah, it was it was very exciting. Uh, unfortunately, it tasted terrible. But <laughs> I'm glad we do have some memories. <laughs> um, yes, and the other thing I'll always remember about Gandhi is uh, the one letter I received a year <laughs> from the ages of ten. I think maybe 
when email was 40 years old. <laughs> so when I was 22, I got a letter, one letter a year from Gandhi, who maybe struggled to fix her computer around <laughs> when the repair guy was on holiday. <laughs> but yeah, I think those are the things we would treasure. Thank you. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christians are sometimes accused of being a little out of touch with reality, and of, in fact, hoodwinking their followers um, with a, a, a sense of a false kind of future. Uh, Karl Marx, as uh, Reverend Alan Williams in his uh, daily devotion this morning reminded us, um, described Christianity as the opiate of the masses. And he knew what he was talking about because he saw the Russian Orthodox Church uh, in the uh, very early part of the 20th century, and it certainly was not a church, I think, that followed Christ. The point is that Christians are often accused of promising people pie in the sky when they die by and by. Shirley did not believe that. It was my privilege and my pleasure to visit Shirley for some eight years to pray with her before she climbed into the car to drive to Cape Town all by herself. <laughs> Lord, please protect this person. <laughs> to marvel at the flowers that she produced in church week after week while she was still able to. And then when those physical capacities failed her, to sit with her on that beautiful stoop. And Louise, her niece, was saying, I can't imagine that stoop without her. And to share in the Holy Communion, the home communion with her, which she loved. We had long discussions. I mean, you've heard from her family just what a fascinating, interesting, complex person she was. And that extended to her faith life. She wanted to know. And her faith would not be satisfied until we had worked through every question which she brought up. Why did Jesus have to die? Thank you, Shirley. Do I really have to answer that? And so for the next 40 minutes or so, we would chew on that and, and come to some kind of resolution where she would say, that seems to make sense. Thank you, John. Whew. Why do we believe that the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of Christ? And so we would explore that and work through that. Every time I visited, there was a new challenge, a new question, and a new enjoyment, not in being able to provide the answer, but in being able to work towards a resolution of the question together. And that's what I loved about it. Shirley was the epitome of life. She knew exactly what Paul was right. We read this passage together, I remember. I think on two occasions. Death, where is thy sting? Death, where is thy victory? And she would say, actually, death is not the end, is it, John? No, she I know that, she said. I feel it right here. And so she could live life to the full in the confidence 
of knowing that there was a yet fuller life that awaited her after she had shed the incapacity of a leg which refused to do what she wanted it to do, certainly in the latter years, and of a body which became increasingly frail, but the spirit, the spirit never, never wavered. And so she could subscribe to that passage. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. And she would say, Amen to that. The other passage which she loved was also from that same letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the first letter. And it was that well-known passage which is so often, I think, abused at weddings. The passage, 1 Corinthians 13, about love. Because Shirley had a huge heart for love. She knew that love does not insist on its own way. Because Shirley lived for others. It is not quick to take offense. Shirley did not take offense easily at all. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Shirley loved what was right and was true. Love is patient and kind. Shirley acknowledged that she wasn't always patient. Especially when she knew what she wanted to achieve and things got in her way. But patience won in the end and kindness, well, she knew all about that. It is not jealous or boastful. Shirley was not jealous. And while she would boast about her children and grandchildren, she didn't boast about what she had achieved. It is not arrogant or rude. I cannot imagine Shirley ever having been arrogant or rude. It was just not in her nature. Like love in which she believed, she bore all things with patience and endurance. She believed, she endured. She believed love will never come to an end. There are three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love and surely embodied that love. And so, yes, we are here to celebrate a life lived in victory. Amen? You can say amen if you like. <laughs> a life lived in victory. Because she knew how to live life to the full. She loved life. And she clung to it. Can I tell them the story, Louise? Three times, Louise phoned me and said, John, I think you better go and see Shirley. I think her last hour has come. Clutching my little bottle of anointing oil and a prayer book, I would hurry to Shirley's bedside and would say, how are you, Shirley? And on at least one occasion, she was totally uncommunicative. And I thought, yep, this is it. Anointed her for her final journey. Louise arrived that afternoon to find her sitting up drinking tea with the people in the uh, frail care of God and <laughs> passing the time of day. <laughs> and on another occasion when George and I visited, because, yeah, George would go there every Friday afternoon to read to Shirley. And we both agreed Shirley is on her way out. She woke up that afternoon and wanted porridge because she thought it was breakfast time. <laughs> Louise sent me a WhatsApp saying, John, you're not doing any good. I'm not sending you to Shirley again. I send you to administer the last rites and you breathe the breath of life into it. <laughs> but that was Shirley. She loved life. She clung to it. But when the time came, she was ready. And she has gone before us. 
echoing those promises that Paul makes. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Shirley knows the truth of that promise. And I think her life and her death challenge us in so many ways. Challenge us to live a life of selflessness lived for others. A life lived in service to others by serving her Lord. And her death challenges us to die confident that we know that the Christian faith is not an opiate, is not a false promise, but a reality which millions of Christ followers down the centuries have experienced. Shirley is in that great company of the communion of saints. Hallelujah. Amen. If you would like to turn to page 539 in the prayer book in front of you, those small prayer books, or will it be on the screen, Mary? Will it be on the screen? Should be. We are now going to spend a short time in prayer. And if you want to follow, and if there is a prayer book in front of you, but many of you will know the words anyway, we're going to spend a short time in prayer and commend Shirley to the love and care of our Heavenly Father. Before we do that, I invite you to spend just a minute or so in silence, recalling your own particular memory of a much-loved woman, a much-loved Christ follower. So may the Lord be with you. And also with you. So let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We join together in the prayer our Lord himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And deliver us from evil. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so let us commend our sister, our mother, our grandmother, Shirley, to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Heavenly Father, by your mighty power, you have given us life, and in your love you have given us new life in Christ Jesus. We entrust Shirley to your merciful keeping in the faith of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who died and rose again to save us and is now alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit in glory forever. Amen. We pray especially for those who will feel Shirley's loss most keenly, her close family and those who were very close to her. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, Deal graciously with those who mourn, that casting all their care on you, they may know the consolation of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we pray for ourselves because nothing is more certain than that in God's good time we shall all end up in this situation.
Grant us, Lord, the wisdom and grace to use aright the time that is left to us here on earth. Lead us to repent of our sins, both the evil we have done and the good we have not done. And strengthen us to follow in the steps of your Son, in the way that leads to the fullness of eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God, in his infinite love and mercy, bring the whole church, living and departed, in the Lord Jesus, to a joyful resurrection and the fulfillment of his eternal kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. You've heard that George Niven would almost every, every Friday read to Shirley on that stoop. So we invite George now to read his last tribute to Shirley in a poem. <coughs> We used to read it round about this time. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done. Home art gone, and tan thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant's stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. The scepter, learning, Physic must all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all dreaded thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. No exorciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee. Quiet consummation have and renowned be thy grave. Let us stand together and sing Love Divine, O Love Itself.
The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender to those that fear him. For he knows of what we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. The days of man are but as grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone. And, it plays, and its place will know it no more. But the mercifully goodness of the Lord endures forever and ever. Toward those that fear him and his righteousness upon their children's children. And to the Lord's most gracious mercy and protection, we entrust our sister Shem and we commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to be cremated in shore and certain hope of the resurrection, to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again for us. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And Hallelujah. I have heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. For their deeds follow them. God will show us the path of life. In his presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand there is pleasure forevermore. Now unto him that we may be able to keep from failing and present you, faultless before the presence of the glory, with exceeding joy, and to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. May the angels lead you into, into paradise. May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. May the choir of angels welcome you, where Lazarus is poor no more. May you have eternal rest. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. You only are immortal, creator and maker of all, and we are mortal, formed of the earth. And to the earth we shall return, as you ordained when you created us, saying, Thus you are. Thus you shall return. We all go down to the dust. We give the grave, we make our song. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, now you let your servants go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of everything. Their lives to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your. 